Hello, greetings. So happy to be here. Uh, I get paid to teach Thai language to Thai language learners, so I don't get to talk a lot about my research because they won't understand me. Um, so this is such a joy. Also, there's a snow uh, winter advisory system in Chicago, so I'm glad to not be in that right now. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Dr. Long said, my name is Kanjana Teporirak. That is a very short Thai last name. Uh, and we just only have last names for the past, about past 80 years or so, right? Last names are a new thing. And uh, I got my last name when the Thai government decided that people of Chinese descent all have to have Thai last names in order to have government jobs. So my great grandfather went and got a Thai last name. And for those of you who are from uh, Chinese culture or Chinese culture adjacent, you know that four syllables is very inauspicious, right? So they did that to him. Um, but at least they gave him an auspicious name. My last name, uh, Te Borirak, is beloved by the spirits. Right, so te is the same root word as deva, dios, dios, right? Um, and borirak. I used to want to be a Spanish teacher before I did this, so it's so a lot of similarities with Thai and Spanish. Um, so today, and come on, remote. Are you kidding me? No. Hold on. Let me. Wait, you have to turn. Do you turn on? Okay, it should be on. Right. That's Don't make. Hmm. What happened? Oh, because of the mouse? Oh. Boo, hiss. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fine. I'll, I'll do this. Oh, you can send and do that? No, we're good. Okay. okay. So my talk today is going to be called Looking the Part, right? And you were promised fashion, nation, and so on. So I'll try to deliver on that. And my area of focus is very niche, as we all do in our PhD. So I researched the period from 1939 to 1941. That's what I do, but I like do the shit out of it, okay, for the two years. Um, so that's okay, that's okay. Quality over quantity, right? So before we do that, let's do a quick vibe check with everybody. Go ahead and scan that. And see where we're at. There are two questions. Please remember to submit so that you get the second question. Right, it's an evening class. Not everybody thrives after 5 p.m. Um, it's not supposed to be, a, it's not a trick question. Just pick an otter <laughs> um, that best represents you, yep. I can. Let's see if it works. Oh, hooray. Thanks. Spoilers, spoilers. OK, did everyone participate? Yes? Oh, look at where we're at. Let's just do it this way. Oh, okay, so about even, Oh, poor number four, no one's feeling him, that's okay. He looks exhausted, or she. Um, I can't tell the difference <laughs> what an otter is. Okay, excellent. Second question. present. Ah, it's not letting me present. Why is it not letting me present? Oh, there it goes. If all goes well, it should just pop up. Don't copy other people. Live your truth. None. For real? Wow. Tai Chi. Yes. Owl face. Okay, I don't know what that means. What is Pibun Songkam? That is my entire research agenda. My day is going great. Oh, what otter do I feel like? That is an excellent question. I'd have to go back to look at the otter.
None yet. I like it. About the place. I don't know what place. Um, what will I eat for dinner? Oh, well, I'm vegetarian, so it depends how you feel about that. Um, I'm also 44, so I like need a lot of fiber. Uh, you guys are young. Eat whatever you want. <laughs> I don't know if this is how you feel, but this is the hottest you guys are ever going to be in your whole life. Um, speaking from experience. Um, so just enjoy that. I'm sorry, this is getting recorded. <laughs> oh, yikes. Oh, okay. Is my stylistic choices inspired? No. Um, okay. All right. So we'll we'll get we'll get back to this. Let's boat noodle. Ooh. Just so y'all know, boat noodle does have pork blood in the broth. So take that as you may. Not super vegetarian. Okay. So we're back. Based on the last names in the class, one person can read this, besides me and Gun. <laughs> okay, before we get too far, I am paid to teach a language, so let's do a little bit of that. This is how we say greetings in Thailand. Uh, it was also only coined about 80 years ago, so it's new. This is not how we used to say hello. Um, but as part of this modernization process that you'll learn more about today, uh, a professor at Jualongkorn University, which is the first university of Thailand, came up with this phrase. Right? And homie was just like, let's do this. So we'll be doing it. Um, and here's how you pronounce it. Okay? So, all together. Sa. Sa. Wat. Di. Di. Sawadi. Okay, so that works as aloha. It works as greetings. You say it when you leave. You say it when you say hello. Um, now, the fun part is Thai is a gendered language but not gendered in a way that maybe you're used to in learning European languages or other languages, right? So Thai gender system is traditionally non-binary, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it does inform the polite article, politeness article that we use to end every phrase. So I am a feminine identifying speaker, therefore I use a particular uh, polite ending, right? Um, now, the nice thing about Thai gender is that the speakers choose your own adventure. And this can change throughout your life, right? We don't have to do the whole my pronoun is because the only thing that's gendered is the first person pronoun, right? So when you refer to yourself, you use that pronoun that works for you. So I, it was really interesting to do kind of a pronoun introduction because I was like, we don't, yeah, that's just, we don't do that. We don't do that in Thai language because you just choose whatever you want. So you get a choice. And, and our gender is very much a spectrum, it's more nuanced than this, but in terms of politeness ending, we have three choices, right? You can choose for me, sawadika. Sawadika, right? If you're neither here nor there, not feeling particularly masculine, feminine, or you want to do a neutral, sawadika. Sawadika, right? If you're a masculine identifying person, you can say sawadika. Right? There's actually a lot of studies on how this ending is used to model gender to children, right? to transition for uh, trans people. And so there's a lot of interesting um, gender language related studies happening in Thai studies. So I'm going to say sawadika to you, and you're going to choose your own adventure, and you're going to say it back. We are going to put our hands together like the prayer emoji. Everybody knows. Elbows in. Right, certain um, cultures that have their hands, arms out, right? Like South Asian culture will have their elbows out. Indonesian and Malaysian have their elbows out. Thai, Lao, Cambodian, Burmese, we have our elbows in. Keep our elbows in, prayer emoji. <laughs> right, so I'm gonna say sawadee ka to you and you're gonna say it back with whatever ending works for you. Okay, are we ready? Yes, sawadee ka. Love it, okay. So now you know how to say hello and goodbye <laughs> in Thai. Okay, so I'm a linguist by training, um, but I actually want to be a historian. So now I only do historical works. And what is history, right? Some people hate history, some people love history. People are like, ah, oh, it's so boring, so much of dates, a bunch of dead white guys. So I see history in three different ways as like a sedimentary 
thing, right? We have layers upon layers of events, decisions, policies, people happening. When you dig down, you see the evidence of all that came before. You can see it as a palimpsest. Who has heard this word before? No one went to seminary school. Okay. Palimpsest is a layer, right? So back in the day when paper was really expensive, right? When, when things were made um, by hand and it was really hard to produce new paper, what they used to do was wash off all the ink and then write over the old stuff. So a palimpsest, when you look it through light or x-ray, right? A lot of art historians do this now they can see all the layers that came before, right? That's what, um, you probably have seen photos of like Da Vinci's paintings or the Mona Lisa and the layers underneath, right? That's a palimpsest, right? So even though what you see is on top, that's what you're experiencing, all the things that came after it, there's evidence, right? So to me, a history is a little bit like a palimpsest or sedentary, you know, sediment or like growth rings, right? When you cut a tree, Scientists can tell how much carbon dioxide was in the air. Was there a drought? Was there a flood? Was there a forest fire? Right? This is history. It's not dead people. It's not dates. It's how we got here. Right? It's how we got here. The things that we are experiencing and the way that we're experiencing, experiencing it is, is all based on what happened before. Right? So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to do a little path. We're going to start at Prelapsarian Siam, right? I'm a humanities PhD. I use all these words. We'll go over what these words mean, right? And we're going to end up in the present. And that's the path we're going to take. And it's purposefully squiggly, right? It's not linear. It's a lot of back and forth, a lot of things in the way. So how do we get from here? to here. That's what this talks about. Does, it, does anyone not know who this woman is right now? Somebody, some K-pop fan explained it to them in like a fan <laughs> from the, f if she's your bias, now's your time. <laughs> anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, what's black pink? Well, they renewed their group contract. It's fine. Oh, no, oh word? They're, they, don't, they don't work for YG anymore. Oh, good. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I was like, I've been in Irvine. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, what? Okay, Blackpink. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is she on my slide? Yeah, so what's La Lisa? Um, one of her songs. Her solo song. Okay, there it is. I did not know what Blackpink was <laughs> because I'm old um, and I like read stuff for research. And uh, I do a pre semester survey, right? Like, why are you taking Thai? Why are you interested? And somebody was like, Lisa Blackpink. And I'm like, what the fuck is Lisa? Um, I looked it up. I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, so now she's on my presentation slide. Right, but um, we'll we'll see why this picture is important. And if you if you haven't already seen it, there's a reaction video of Thai people when they saw this outfit in her music video. It made me cry. Okay, so words, right? Palimpsest. You don't you don't have to know this. You can also Google it later. Um, where do you think I pulled this from, right? And also prelapsarian, prelapsarian. It has, um, oh, sorry, I meant to say, I'm a bad linguist. Palimpsest has Greek root. It means layers, removed layers. Prelapsarian, from the same word root as laps. So it has biblical connotation, as in before the fall of man. Um, and I use that to refer to the period before the end of absolute monarchy, because that's how it's referred to a lot of times in history. Afterlife. 
pretty <laughs> straightforward. What happens after you die? Interwar, not that deep. Time between the wars, right? Which wars? World War I and World War II, right? So 1939 to 1941 falls right after the interwar period. Right? There are only 18 years between World War I and World War II, which is like bonkers <laughs> to think about because it wasn't that long. It was like within one generation, they had two world wars. Then diaspora, another Greek word root. It means to scatter, right? A lot of us are members of the diaspora, people who have been geographically removed from their traditional ancestral homeland, right? So there are the words. You may or may not need to know them, but Gun is taking notes, so maybe for the quiz. I don't know. <laughs> I don't work here. Okay. So Thailand today, Dr. Long already talked a little bit about Thailand, right? There it is, situated in Southeast Asia. It's part of mainland Southeast Asia. The geographical region of Southeast Asia is divided into two groups, mainland and insular, right? So insular, is that where your pointer is? Yep. Insular's here, made of islands, mainland's here. All right, so Malaysia is actually considered part of insular because of their Austronesian culture. They're more closely related to uh, Indonesia. In fact, their languages are um, mutually intelligible, right? So Malaysian and Indonesian can understand each other. They share 80% um, of the vocabulary. So my hometown is the capital, Bangkok. It also has um, the pleasure of having the longest place name in the world. And as a child, I had to get up in front of class and recite this name because it's my hometown, right? So what it essentially, oh, there's a song. I'm supposed to show you a song. Um, and you can sing along, it's karaoke style. Okay, are y'all ready to sing the name of my hometown? Oh no, there goes. Nope, sound's not working. It was working before. Oh, there it goes. It just needed a minute. Oh my God. It's 80s rock also and the internet's garbage. Um, one moment, let's uh, let it load itself. So it means this Grung Tep. Grung is city. Tep is the same tape as my last name. So spirits, angels. So we have the same name as Los Angeles, <laughs> city of angels. Um, let's see if they'll play now. Sing along if you know the words. <laughs> Oh, I want. It won't do full screen. I'm sorry. Oh, they're in, they're killing me with this. Notice the imagery too, right? This is made by a foreigner. Okay, one more time, here we go. Here's your chance. Um, illustrious city of the Yotaya Empire, Hindu. The royal city. Okay, it, it goes like five more times. We don't need that. Even though it's a long name, it's a long song. Um, okay. Oh, wow. Come on, internet. Okay. There we go. All right, so Bangkok, Grung Thep. Right, there's the name. That's, that's the quiz, y'all. I just have to write it. <laughs> oh, man, that's hilarious. Okay. Um, sing it in front of class for everybody. Uh, the last record I could find of the population is approximately 70 million, right? This is World Bank. Hopefully you'll get a chance to discuss the problem of World Bank uh, statistics and what that means and what it excludes, but we don't have time to find out today. Uh, it is also considered, oh dear me, spoilers. It also considered a medium, a, a upper middle 
income. Of course, there's a lot of income disparity, wealth disparity in Thailand, just like anywhere else in the world. And we have four countries that share contiguous borders with us, right, our neighbors. Okay, so the thing we're going to talk about is how Siam became Thailand. Who knows what Siam or have heard Siam before Siamese twins, right? Excellent. Um, Siamese twin, Siamese cats, right? We have two things going for us. Uh, so Siam became Thailand abruptly on June 24th, 1939, right? And this declaration here, this is a reprint of the declaration, um, says that Siam is now Thailand. Like Siamese people went to sleep, woke up Thai, right? That's how crazy this is. Um, but how did we get here? <laughs> How did we get here? Why did they have to declare that this is Thailand? That, and that Thai people are Thai, right? Who does that? Um, and all businesses with Siam in their name must change their names, right? But you can keep, we can keep our language. We're not going to speak a new language because the language has always been Thai, right? So let's go back a little bit to see how we got here. So this is a map of territories that were ceded to nearby European colonial powers, right, with their flag. It's, it's from a German source, so if you can read German, uh, that's what it says on the bottom. And um, Dr. Long said a little bit about the Siamese geo body, right, Ajahn Tong Chai Vinichikun, the, the really emotional video. He's also my history teacher. He uh, supervised my senior thesis, so that video was very impactful for me. Um, he wrote this, right? So the narrative we grew up was that Thai kings were so good, they were so strategic, they were so smart, they were able to avoid colonial power. It's like, eh? I don't know, man. Um, that's what he said, right, in his book. <laughs> was like, we were just conveniently a buffer zone, right? That's how we came up with the shape that we have um, for our. And then um, my dear friend, uh, Shane Stratty, wrote kind of a sequel to his book called Lost Territories. Um, and the narrative that it, people use, right, to feed nationalism, lost, lost territories. And then um, the thing about Siam never being formally colonized, right, what's informal colonialism? If you're interested in the in long-term impact of unequal power dynamics between dominant nations and lesser powered nations, look up this article by Michael Hertzfield. He coined the term crypto colonialism. And that really helps to, ex and Thailand was one of the case studies that he uses to define that term and what it looks like in real life. All right, so here are kind of the main citations that I use. Um, but interestingly, as we gave all these this, uh, territories to Europeans, all these treaties already mentioned Prathet Thai, right? Prathet means country. It's the same root if you're from South Asian. It's Pradesh, right? There's a lot of uh, territories, Pradesh. Um, Prathet Thai means nation, the area of the Thai people. Raj Anachak, the royal kingdom of Thai, right? So even though we were Siam, all of our treaties with Western nations said Thai, right? So maybe this is where it started. Maybe that's where we got our name from. Okay, so Siam and Sivilai. If you look into Thai history um, at all, you'll see the word Sivilai. So Sivilai is the Thaianization of the English word civilized. Right, Sivilai. So here we have Rama 5. Oh, I'm supposed to be reading my script. Here's my script. Hold on. I don't want to accidentally not say the things I want to say. I even put like a little star on the slide to tell me to read my script. <laughs> Okay, so the person on the photo that you see is Rama 5. Uh, the Rama numbering system of Thai kings was a Western adaptation, right? We have like Charles the first, second, third. Um, so that just started in the 1910s. Uh, so Rama 5, if you've seen the movie or the play musical, The King and I, anyone? King and I, musical fans, yes? Rama 5 was the son in that musical. Right, his father is Rama IV. So Rama V became the first Siamese monarch to travel to Europe. So his first visit was 1897, and the king wowed the European press with his stylish suits. And he went to Savile Row 
and got suits there, right? It was very significant. It cost a ton of money. Um, and layup servers, like, you know, all the fashion magazines and the gossip columns wrote about how stylish he looked. So he masterfully used this new medium of photography to perform a persona, right? A Western king persona. He even sent 11 of his 34 sons to Eton, right? Eton is where Prince Harry went, where Prince William went, right? So he, he really aligned himself aesthetically to European kings. So his son was educated, his son here, Brahma VI, was educated um, at Eton and also at Sandhurst Military Academy, which is also where Prince Harry went, right? Uh, in fact, I think Prince, Crown Princess Eleonora from Spain is at Sandhurst right now, getting trained, right? It's where princess and prince and kings go to get military training. And I think our current king, he went, but then he got kicked out. Different story. Okay, so his son, Rama VI, only reigned for 15 years, but he was obsessed even more so with the aesthetics of the monarchy, right? In particular, the masculine, militarized aesthetics of the monarchy. So here he is sitting in the middle with all of his men. And when I say his men, I mean his men, right? Um, there's a book that I'm translating about kind of his gender performance during his reign. He designed all of these outfits for them, which is why none of them look alike, <laughs> right? A military uniform during his period was like bonkers because he was like, oh, that looks nice, right? So there'd be people in the army who look nothing alike because he was like, oh, let's add a, let's add a ribbon. I like the, I like the feather. Um, so there he is. And he, during his reign, he codified masculinity. Right? He put out all these policies. He made the men in his court behave a certain way, live a certain way, dress a certain way. And it was all very militarized aesthetics. So two kings worth of that, right? We get a Siamese monarchy that is westernizing their aesthetics publicly through photograph, right? To look like European monarchs. And, you know, successful, right? Unisex clothing and practice, you see, let me go back and see. Um, right, there's Rama 5 on this postcard, and then Rama 6 in the new version of the postcard. Right, this postcard was circulated twice in the early 1900s. It was called the ruling monarch of the world. Very, you'll notice very few Asians are included, right? But Rama 5 and Rama 6, successfully got themselves on this postcard and it was considered a victory for them. I know that real, the two dudes in the middle look real alike. And it's so funny because the three in the middle are about to go into war with each other from based on the guy with the white beard up there. <laughs> so Everybody is related and everybody about to shoot everybody. Um, as you do, as you do. Okay, so by the time we get to the interwar period, right, we're at World War I now, people are, Europeans are shooting each other. Rama VI decides, I, we, I'm a part of this monarchy, brotherhood of kings is what he says. So he decides to send some poor Thai dudes to Europe to fight in World War I, but he made sure he sent them so late, they were there for like five months and it was over. He's like, well, I was there. Um, <laughs> it's like the ultimate kind of like, a, Instagram check-in, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, they didn't really do much. Um, and then he, like, we built a whole monument about being a part of the victory. It was, it's crazy. Um, but 1932, people um, who were Western educated, like Dr. Long said on Tuesday, decided that maybe we don't want an absolute monarchy anymore. So they did a declaration, 1932, Ended absolute monarchy, first constitution issued December 10th, still constitutional day to this day in Thailand. And King Rama VII, three years later, couldn't renegotiate his contract with the Thai people, let's just say, and he abdicated, right? Abdicated meaning he just quit his job, right? The Queen of Denmark just abdicated the throne recently. People are pushing for Charles III to abdicate the throne, right? Um, he was just like, I'm out. Also, Homi was not supposed to be king, right? He's number 34 out of 34 sons. He was like, oh, I'm good. 
But then everybody died. And he was like, last of us, <laughs> you know, like, because he, he was just living his life, you know, and they're like, yeah, we're going to need you to be a king. So his heart wasn't really in it anyways. But here's this man. He's the focus. Somebody asked, what is Pibun Songkram? That is Pibun Songkram. That is his royal title. Pibun means, uh, what is Pibun? Like full of, abundant of, Songkram is war. Um, he's a, a, a army general, so it makes sense. I love his main energy character, like main character energy. Look at him. He's like, yeah. <laughs> so Field Marshal Black, Pibun Songkram. He came into power in 1939. He kind of took advantage of all of this political turmoil after the end of absolute monarchy and slid in there and became our first of very many military dictator. Oh, dear me. Okay. So he was in power twice, second time courtesy of the U.S. government, because the U.S. liked him for being anti-communist. They were like, eh, your dictator is fine. Um, but he also ushered in a new king. Right? And he did all of this cultural codification and um, reformation. Right? He's the only person to successfully reform the Thai spelling system. And the minute they kicked him out, they, they reverted back. So now we have a crazy spelling system again. So now we're here. We've arrived. Thailand is now Thailand. Pibun Songkram is in power. It's 1939. It's June 20, uh, 24th. He issued a total of 12 cultural mandates. Right? The first one was the one that declared Thailand as Thailand. Right, what else did the other 11 do? It transformed Siam into Thailand and all people living in the borders of Thailand, regardless of your ethnicity, into Thai people. So it did a lot of ethnic linguistic erasure um, as part of this policy. It also dictated a new and modern way of life. He literally said, you need to eat noodles for lunch. I kid you not. It also said Thai people cannot eat more than four times a day, which means that we were 100% eating more than four times a day, <laughs> right? Because otherwise, he wouldn't have to tell us. Um, it also said we needed to shower only three times, please, in instead of however many times we were showering before. So he was trying to usher Thailand into a new kind of modern, westernized, life, part of the global um, way of life. Designate a new mode of dress. That's what we'll spend time talking about today. Describe duties of nation building. You can Google this. There's like a 12 cultural mandate Wikipedia page, OK? Yeah, I know you all like type in a way. Um, and it sanctified the nation and the monarchy to a very less degree because they just overthrew them, right? And the king's a nine-year-old in Switzerland. Um, he was, he like did, yeah, that's a different story, different, different presentation <laughs> um, for the Thai people, right? Because now that we don't have a king, what's, who, what's holding us together, right? So we're going to focus on Mandate 10. That's what my research does. So what did Mandate 10 say? Here's the document, right? Oh, I have a script. Hold on. These pictures mean something. What slide am I on? 18. Thank you. I don't want to skip the good stuff if I had good stuff to say, you know. Oh, no, I don't have a script for this slide. Just kidding. All right. So it was issued in January 15. So we're coming on 83 year anniversary of this policy. Um, and it connected Thai-ness to an aesthetic, to a way to dress and a way to look in a very uniform way across all class of people, right? Before we had what was called sumptuary laws. Europe had this as well. Uh, ancient Greece had this as well, right? Certain fabrics, certain colors could only be worn by certain people. So we had that based on class. But this new dress code uniform just went, it applied to everybody. Right? For the first time in Siamese or Thai history. And it also showed you how you're supposed to look Thai. 
right? And the language was super vague. So because pr propaganda, you have to be kind of vague. Otherwise, people might, you know, find a loophole to it, right? If you don't say what it is, then you can be like, well, what we meant was, right? And you'll see that across all different types of propaganda throughout history. So the text says, all ties must dress appropriately. Already it's vague. You're like, what is appropriately? <laughs> right? What does it mean? But lots of words, I know. Let's just pay attention to the, the one. And I'm, I didn't know if anybody had red color distinction issues, so I apologize if this color coding doesn't work for you. I, we didn't know. Um, so just stick with the bold and italics. That can still help you um, with the distinction. So it says that ties don't look proper right now in public. Right? The ways that we have been dressed for hundreds of years, it was like not going to do it anymore. So let's, let's do it a new way. Right? Let's dress appropriately. And what's interesting here is in accordance with the culture of the Thai nation. Right? If it's your culture, why do you have to tell me if it's according to my culture? And why is it new? Why is it not like the way I was doing it before? Because they're trying to build. Remember, like Thai people just became Thai in June, right? This is January. <laughs> they're like, what's happening? So every mandate, tell them, now that you're Thai, what does that mean? What do you need to do? How, how can you be Thai? So clothing that's considered proper, uniforms. He's a military guy, of course, right? Uniforms. Uniforms are always proper. Western clothing, second, right? Remember, who's been to Thailand? It's, it's hot, yeah? So traditionally, we just covered our bottom half, right? You saw the first photo of that woman. It is hot, y'all. It's in the tropics. Nobody trying to wear Western clothes. Um, but he said, now we have to wear Western clothes. Or traditional clothing, whichever, if properly worn, right? So this is super vague. It's so vague that people are like, what are you talking about? What does this even mean, right? And they're like, no worries. We've got more propaganda to help you. But interestingly, all of these supplemental texts were addressed to dear Thai sisters, right? Esteemed Thai sisters everywhere. So dudes like, we're already proper or what's going on? There's no equivalent body of text that address men. Right, so this, and this project came to be, I didn't mean to do this, this is an accidental, an accidental project. I was looking for something else, and all of these texts kept coming up in archives. I'm like, what the fuck, <laughs> you know? I'm like, why, this is so effing weird? And so I started reading into them, and it was really interesting, so I ended up doing a research on this. And because it was like, what it's not saying, right? What's missing, right? Only Thai women were getting these texts that were addressed to them. So here's the volume and copies of the text. I think as, as a, an archival researcher, I think it's always important to show the actual text, right? Um, of what it looks like, what it feels like. Uh, this volume was printed, it was a reprint of all of these texts and it was handed out at like a government uh, grand opening party for uh, civil servants. So the first text, the minister's plea to our sisters. Right. So it's interesting as a linguist, right, to look at how people use language. People who are pleading with others are, are coming up from a place that below the person, right, that they're talking to. Usually pleading is like getting on your knees, you're groveling, you're begging. It's not something that happens to people who are equal to you. Right. So why did the dictator decide to use this word? And thus, is he pleading though, right? What does it mean to use the word plea in a propaganda that's gonna become law, right? What is it trying to say? So the first text said, dear Thai sisters, um, in order to commemorate the return of our lost territories, Right? The Franco-Thai War of 1941 got back some of those territories from France. In order to commemorate this auspicious event, please grow out your hair. Right? It's hot. We don't want lice. We always had short hair. Right? At least in the central plains. 
and he's speaking from a specific ethnic group, from a specific region. Please grow out your hair. Please cover your upper torso, right? We don't want the bare-breasted look like we saw the first woman in that picture. And please stop wearing um, John Grabein, which is a, a, a pantaloon. And you'll see more pictures of that. So before we had men and women just had one big piece of cloth. We fold it in half, roll it, stick it between our legs, tuck it in, pants, boom. You can use it to cover yourself. It's, it's kind of like a kilt. You can wear it lots of ways. Um, so he said, grow out your hair, cover your boobs, wear a skirt instead of a jonker bin. Right, so what's interesting about this is that northern women, where Khan is from, already had long hair. They already wore a sarong type wrap skirt. Right? Chinese women already had long hair. Malay women already had long hair. They already wore sarong. Right? So who's he talking to? Also, he gave this as a radio address. Right? Radio was limited to license holders only who had to be government off officials. So who is he really talking to? Not everybody had a radio. This is 1941. That's not all. He came back. Second plea to Thai sisters. He's still pleading. Now he's like, and also, could you wear hats, please? Why hats? <laughs> yeah. Is it to Western audiences? No, because it's in Thai. Oh, but, oh, sorry. I don't know yeah. No, no. That's, but it, you're like, why, why in the world? It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. You're right. Right? But hats are a quick visual check of who's loyal to the regime and who's not. Right? If you do like a quick sweep, you're like, yes, yes, no, 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 yes. Right? It's really easy to check on the loyalty of your people if you make them wear something that's really visually easy to check. Third text, they just kept going. They were like super productive. Third text, this dude here, NC, bless his heart. <laughs> he came in and he was like so into hats, you guys. The first text is so boring. He was like, hats can be made from wool. It can be woven. It can be made from cotton. He's just like, the whole text is like how hats can be. Um, and here's how you wear this hat. Wear that hat. Because people were like, what hat? How are we going to wear hats? Because we had work hats. Like if you were a rice farmer, you wear a hat, right? Because it's hot. You got rain on you. It's a work hat. They're like, no, no, no. Not the useful kind. Not, not that kind of hat. The other kind hat. They're like, you mean you, I got to wear a hat when I'm not working? People are like, yeah, yeah. Got those hats, you know? So 10 days later, right? you notice his texts are 10 days apart. NC did his whole thing on hats, and he was like, wear this and that, and I don't know what happened in the 10 days. He came back the second time, he was like, I am so sorry <laughs> to have offended you with when you should wear hats, right? If you read the text, you're like, ooh, he got in trouble with his wife, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it is, it's like super apologetic, right? The first one was like a text, the second one was a radio address. And he was just like, I am so sorry, I did not mean to be pushy and tell you when to wear hats or how you can wear hats. You, of course, know better than me. You know, it was, it's hilarious to read. That's not all, it keeps going. <laughs> Two more. <laughs> I know, right? Why so many? Um, so they were like, people are super confused, especially women. We better form a committee to help them know how to dress. So, I know, it, it was real, people were like, what are you trying to do? Or they don't care, or they weren't following, right? If you read between the lines, you're like, people were not doing what they were supposed to do. So the government is trying so hard to make this happen. And uh, so they come in and they were like, We've, we have formed a committee. For those of you who are still unclear, right? That's like a very passive aggressive way, like professors will do that. Like I noticed there were some questions on the assignment, right? Same. <laughs> um, and so they did two more texts to explain in detail how women should dress, what it should look like, when to wear, what to wear, how, with who. And the only woman involved in these texts made the very last radio speech. 
right? She also opened a hat selling shop. So, you know, uh, we might have some suspicions as to why she was involved. But the interesting thing about these texts is that it asks the women to decide for themselves what's fashionable, what looks good. So it transferred the responsibility of enforcement from the government to other women. It turned a national policy into fashion. And what's even a harsher policing is the fashion world, right? The fashion world is self-policing, it's self-regulating, it's insidious, it's in every part of your life. Even when you try not to be fashionable, you are interacting with the criticism of the fashion world. So everything, beauty magazines, they had pageants, right, of the best looking Thai woman. The first person, by the way, no shock, was half white. <laughs> I mean, that's just on, it's, it tracks. Um, so once nationalism, patriotism nestles itself into the fashion world, the government doesn't have to do anything anymore. Right? Now we have beauty magazines. Now we have photo spreads. Now we have pageants. Now we have uh, clothing. Now we have boutiques. Right? It's like a self-perpetuating thing. When patriotic dress code becomes beauty standards, it's free for the government. It'll just run forever. And we'll talk about that in the afterlife of these policies. Because even though he was overthrown, here he is basking in the glory of his main character energy. Little did he know, this dude right here is about to overthrow him. He does not have a look of adoration on his face. He's just like, mm, it's coming. Um, I mean, compare him to the other guy. This guy is like in love with people in Songkran. This guy is like, yeah, I give you 10 days. <laughs> right? So he overthrew him in 1957 and ushered in a new period of beauty standards that's based on not this type of queen. So she was the royal consort in Rama IV. And that's why he has, she had her photo taken by a European envoy. But new kind of queen. She's wearing the dress code that people in Songkram assigned. Even though he was anti-royalist. Right? She perpetuated. Her hair is long. She's wearing a skirt tube-like. Her torso is covered. Right? So even without the military that particular military regime in power, she's still perpetuating the new, it's now a new beauty standard. It's not considered propaganda. It's not considered a law. It's not considered policy. It's just beauty standard. And she became the new beauty standard. Right? She was on a stamp. Pay attention to her outfit. Right? She went on a tour with her husband, Rama Nain. So he was the second Thai king to have ever traveled during his reign to Europe. They did a world tour, eight months world tour in 1960, right? Remember that they just got brought back into power in 1957? Before this, people did not want a king. It was not popular. They had to go on a PR blitz, right? And they started with other kingdoms that had kings to once again equate themselves, right, with their colleagues in Europe. So eight month world tour, she designed five new outfits, five new Thai outfits that was made by using Western methods, but with Thai fabrics, right? So even though this outfit looks like it's a Thai outfit, it had a zipper in the back, right? She's no longer wrapping cloth around herself. She's evoking Thai-ness in her aesthetics. She had especially custom-made uh, upturned toes, shoes, right, to evoke kind of the Orientalist view and to evoke older royal dress code. And it was made by a uh, house Balmain. Right, so her clothes were French designed with Thai fabrics. 
And those outfits stuck with us. They are now wedding gowns for Thai women. I wore one when I got married, right? It's on the cover. Notice how the middle outfit and her outfit on the stamp, same. It also was the national dress for 2017 Miss Universe. This one was designed by her granddaughter who has since taken up the mantle. Right, there she is on the cover of Vogue in 1962. As part of their media blitz, she did a lot of fashion spread. So this is no different than what happened during the 1940s, right? In terms of perpetuating what ideal Thai, modern Thai femininity looks like. So she was on the cover of Vogue. Notice the upturned shoes, the uh, custom made French designer upturned shoes. And then in 2000, and here she is at the performance in LA um, in 1985 of The King and I. Right? The King and I was banned in Thailand during this time. Still is, also. Still is banned. And she was, she asked, they asked her, don't you find this offensive? And she's like, no, it's fiction. It's fake. It's just a musical. Right? What does it mean for a queen to recognize a rep Western representation of Thainess outside of Thailand in this way? Right? What is she trying to promote Thainess? Why her, not the king? Right? Why not somebody else? And here's 2019, her granddaughter wearing the exact same outfit on the cover of Thai Vogue. Right, so her granddaughter um, has taken up the mantle of promoting Thai fabrics and Thai outfits, and she's designed a lot of new traditional Thai outfits as well. So I want to call this maybe a half-life, right? Maybe not an afterlife. Afterlife is what happens after you die, but clearly this has not died, right? So for those of you who have taken some science classes, what's half-life? Yeah. The amount of time it takes for half something to decay. Exactly, right? So I think that's a more appropriate metaphor. This policy has not died, right? It's been reduced, it's been performed, and there are bits of it that we see in modern day life all the time. Still going, 2018, right? Rama 10 came into power. He wasn't particularly uh, popular, right? He wasn't involved in the same PR blitz that his father was during his reign. So when he came into power, he was like, I need to throw myself a party, right? So he threw a big party and the theme of the party was returning to Thainess. <laughs> And interestingly, it's in the exact same location where Pibun Songkram threw parties to celebrate the end of monarchy, right? So he reclaimed that space as a royalist space. And Thai people were encouraged, in air quotes, to dress traditionally or appropriately so that they can enter this space. It wasn't enforced the same way that Pibun Songkram enforced the dress code, but if you came unprepared to the festival, you can rent a Thai outfit at the exit, at the entry, 250 baht, right? So here we are, we see members of the royal family. Um, this is in 2018, he revived the Rama 5 era winter festival um, and with the goal of, quote, Continuing the tradition of Rama 5's winter festival as well as be a reflection of the relationship between the monarchy and the people. All right, this is from the actual event website. The prime minister, here he is, General Prayut, and his wife dressed in Thai traditional clothes to promote it. And here is the king. He held another one nine months later, too. He was like, in case you missed it, here's another one. Um, and the second one was even more overt, right? The second one was uh, the glory of Ratanako Sin, which is the era of his family's reign. Um, so here he is in the middle, and here's the Chongkrabein that I was talking about, right? Is the cloth. It looks like a pantaloon, sort of. He's next to his sister. I love this picture because it's so spicy. This is before um, he got married. And here's his uh, consort. He had two consorts. He still has two consorts. But here's the one he ended up marrying, and here's the one he likes better. 
They're all there. Um, it's, it's so spicy. If you guys are interested in political science, please do Thailand. You will not have a boring day. And your, your whole entire research agenda will be so interesting. Um, but so there they are dressed in their full traditional Thai clothing, right? All evocative of pre-lapsarian Siamese wear. They're not wearing stuff from post-revolution. Right? They're not wearing stuff from 1941. This is all stuff before the end of monarchy. Probably not by accident. And speaking of encouraging Thai people to look loyal and to perform patriotism, during the year of his coronation, Thai people were encouraged out of the 12 months to wear yellow color for eight months out of that time. Right? Why yellow? And he mentioned before that yellow is considered part of the royalists, right? So when the seven days a week system was introduced to Thai people, um, a lot of people were illiterate and they had to introduce this new system. We had a lunar calendar before. Nobody cares about the seven day work week. Uh, the government introduced it by color coding each day. Starts with Monday, yellow, Tuesday, pink, Wednesday, green. And the local government office would raise a colored flag and people are like, ah, yes, green, it's Wednesday, right? We, don't, we didn't care, right? But they had to teach the people somehow. And it became a part, it became a part starting in Rama fifth time, a part of the royal signet, a part of the royal standard, right? So royal standard flags will have the color of the day that particular member of the family was born. He lucked out because he and his father were both born on Monday. So he can kind of have this level of visual continuity to his reign, right? So yellow stayed the same. If you look at like the, the Pantone yellow, it's like slightly different, like the R RGB values are different, but not perceivably, right, to the eye. But if you really look it up, the, the RGB values are a little bit different between their two yellows. Um, so eight months of the year, you know, show your... Uh, show your loyalty, right? Another quick way to do a visual check of who's patriotic, who's royalist, who loves the king and who doesn't, right? Who's going to wear yellow, who's not? So we're definitely still in the half-life stage. And here are people in the diaspora, right? These people don't even live in Thailand anymore. They haven't lived there for 40 years. But they're still wearing the royalist color, right? They're still wearing the outfits prescribed by people in Songkram. They're still wearing the outfits that Sirikit designed. Right? It has not left us, not even in the diaspora. It's become a part of performing Thai-ness removed from the traditional homeland. Right? So this is from Wat Thai in um, LA. That's also in Wat Thai in LA. So the queen, her uh, the former queen, uh, the queen mother, her birthday was Friday, so her color was blue. So to celebrate her birthday, everybody wore blue in the outfits that she designed. Here's a new Thai clothing boutique just opened in LA a couple of years ago. You can buy the outfits that have been designed, right? Buy city kit for your wedding, for your whatever special occasion. The entire shop had one rack of walls for silk shirts for men. The rest were for women, right? So that uneven asymmetrical application and expectation of perpetuating Thai-ness on bodies is still made of women, right? That demand. Men, you'll notice in the other photo, they're wearing suits. Even people who are going to school abroad are in on it. These are graduates, Thai graduates from foreign institutions. It's become a trend on Instagram to wear a Thai, traditional Thai outfit to your graduation. Even Lisa Manoban is doing it, right? Her very first solo piece with a K-pop group. She gave a whole interview, if you watch the behind the scenes, about how important it is for her to dress Thai, right, in this video, for her to perform Thai-ness. And her outfit is exactly, kind of like a K-pop version of what the queen designed, right? Very similar with the headpiece. If you compare this side by side with the stamp, right, there's like a K-pop version of what the stamp photo was. Um, and interestingly, of course, she comes from an area that's not ethnically Thai, um, she comes from an area that's ethnically Khmer, so same as Cambodian. 
And the, the set that you see in the background is a recreation of a Cambodian Hindu temple that's in Buridam province. So it's not even Thai. So that's more questions, right, of what Thai-ness means. But it tracks with what people in Songkran was trying to say, that everybody's Thai now, regardless of your ethnicity. Right? So in a way, he was wildly successful. Right? If you want to be really good at marketing, maybe check out his propaganda. He also wrote songs, you guys. He wrote songs. And I remember, I didn't know they were propagandic songs because I used to get sung that song to be like to wake up, like for my, for my parents to wake me up as a kid. And here comes another uh, main character, energy dictator, Prayut. He was like, you know what? It worked really well, the 12 cultural mandates. I'm going to introduce a new 12 na national value, right? But as opposed to the public life, this one is very inward. I know you guys can't read the Thai. <laughs> well, a few of us, three of us can. But um, so this version of the 12 values, children have to recite this before the beginning of school every day, right? Before it was all directed at adults. This one is directed to children. And not to be outdone, he also gave weekly uh, television address. Right? The title of the address is Returning Happiness to the People, which his organization was called uh, National Coalition for Peace and Order. It's like cartoonishly villainous. You know, like he was like, I want to be like a Marvel <laughs> villain. <laughs> I'm going to name my government National Coalition Peace and Order, which means that they were not about peace and order, right? And there was no coalition. But he gave uh, return happiness to the people address every week. And it's so interesting. There's lots of research uh, analyzing the, con the text of that and the manner in which it was delivered. He also wrote songs. He wrote songs because he's like, he did study, right? And for people who specialize in people in Songkran, when all this came out, I was like, yo, do you guys not see this? And people are like, oh, no, aren't these songs cute? I was like, no, we already did this. We literally just did this, right, in 940, 1941. But because people in Songkran was an anti-monarchy dictator, he's not taught in school. So, like, no one really knows about him, except now, right? Some of the anti-royalist um, uh, protesters are... Re evoking his imagery again. So he's kind of having a resurgence, a comeback of sorts. And as a student, I always remember sitting there like, so what? Who gives a shit, right? Because I mean, I'm being honest with myself here. It's very niche. So what? All of this, right? pre and Siam, Siamese kings had to perform, right, publicly their modernity. And we do all of that now, right? Keeping up with the latest iPhone, what kind of laptop we had, if you got the shoes, our car, oh, is it a Tesla? Oh my God, it's not electric, you know? Um, and then people had to look gendered, right? European was very gendered. And a lot of chronicles at that time, Europeans were so uncomfortable with their inability to tell the men and the women apart. They were just like, I can't tell them apart. I'm like, y'all, their tits were out. <laughs> what is happening? Why can you tell them apart, right? Like, what it, I didn't, I, like, from the back, what are you talking about? But you, if you read European chronicles from that time, they're like, oh, the men and the women all look the same, you know, which, come on, you've seen breasts. Um, so we succumb, we succumb to that pressure, you know? And once you cover it up, oh, I really don't know, you better grow out your hair so we know who's a man, who's a woman. By the time we got to interwar years, right, Rama Six was like, now that everybody looks like a man and looks like a woman, what does a man supposed to look like, right? So he codified that. He was obsessed with doing that. They had to look militarized again, right? His obsession with masculinity. And to look that way is to be loyal to the king. He demanded it of his subjects. So it's the first time that Siamese people can perform loyalty and patriotism on our bodies. There was no such thing before then. Right? And that seems like a normal thing now, right? You can wear a flag, you can hang a flag in front of your house, right? The MAGA hat has a co certain connotation, right? Lots of people, you go to the, the Puerto Rican parade, there's hella flags, right? So there's ways to do that now that we didn't have it before. And women had to look like Western women, right? Go out their hair. Then by the time we got to the 12 cultural mandates, the gendered were already separated. Now we're like, okay, we know what men are supposed to look like. Let's talk about the women. Let's determine what they look like. They have to be proper, right? They have to look modern. They have to look tied, which means they're loyal, 
loyal to whom it changed, right? The king or to the military dictator. And today, we kept all of that, right? Women have to look Thai. You don't see any man on Instagram wearing Thai clothing at a graduation overseas, zero, right? You can start if you're Thai. And to look Thai is to look royalist, right? There's a connotation now. So that, that performance of loyalty and patriotism on your body has been redefined as loyal to the monarchy, not loyal to the military regime. And even if you're not in Thailand, even if you're born and raised in the United States, you still have to look Thai. You still have to be loyal, right? You still have to be patriotic. And it's definitely a reconstruction of what that means, right? So, history, <laughs> layers, right? Layers, <laughs> layers, right? So I want, even if you don't care about Thailand after this lecture, which is fine, right? Think about why you dress the way you do. What are you trying to perform, right? What, you, you're like, oh, I don't think about that. That's false, quit lying. Right? That's just, that's an identity, right? To posture that you don't care about how you look is an identity in of itself, right? Neutrality is a stance in of itself because you have to choose, you have to decide to be neutral, right? What does it mean to look patriotic within the context of your culture, right? If you like a certain type of music, you have to dress a certain way to perform that. If you go to a concert, dress inappropriately, what, how, how are you perceived by your peers, right? So all that we do, norms, rules, people, and places, to so tie that together. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>